good morning and welcome to our special coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Alumide Makoli, in for your host, Ladi Akedulu Ali. Today, the headlines. Friday morning drone attack on Kyiv sends residents to air raid shelters. Belarus summons Ukraine's ambassador after its air defenses shoot down S-300 missile in village near Ukrainian border. And Putin oversees flag-raising ceremony for Russia's newly built naval vessels. Residents of the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, were urged to head to air raid shelters as sirens wailed across the city early today. Shortly after 2 a.m., Kyiv's city government issued an alert on its Telegram messaging app calling on residents to proceed to shelters. Alexei Kuleba, governor of the Kyiv region, said on Telegram that attack by drones was underway. According to local media outlets, air raid alerts were blaring in Kyiv this morning, Cherkasy and Kirovarad regions due to a possible Russian drone attack. And speaking of attacks, just yesterday, Russia fired scores of missiles into Ukraine, targeting Kyiv and other cities, including Lviv in the west and Odessa in the southwest, sounding people rushing to shelters and even knocking out power one of Moscow's largest aerial assaults. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has said there's been power outages in most of the country after Russian strikes. Unfortunately, there were several hits during the day. Our energy workers and repair crews do everything so that Ukrainians feel the consequence of the strike of the terrorists as little as possible. It is especially difficult in the Kyiv region, in the Lviv region, in Odessa, in Kherson, in Vinnytsia, and Zakarpatia. But this is nothing compared with what could have happened if it were not for our heroic anti-aircraft troops and air defense. The most acute situation is in Bakhmut, Solidar, over the entire line in the Donetsk region. Vladimir Zelensky, president of Ukraine. Meanwhile, Ukraine's military and says that it has shot down 54 missiles out of more than 69 launched by Russia in an attack that began at 7 a.m. local time. Brigadier General Alexei Hermorov of the Armed Forces of Ukraine says the missiles were fired at critical and energy infrastructure facilities in the eastern, central, western, and southern regions. The attack followed an overnight assault by kamikaze drones. Russia has mounted numerous waves of airstrikes in recent months on Ukrainian critical infrastructure, leaving millions without power and heat in freezing temperatures. The latest blitz came hard on the heels of the Kremlin's rejection of the Ukrainian peace plan, insisting that Kyiv must accept Russia's annexation of four Ukrainian regions. Still in the aftermath of Russian strikes, Kyiv authorities say two private hospitals, or rather houses, in the region have been damaged by the fragments of downed missiles as a result of Russian strikes. The mayor of Kyiv, Vitaly Klitschko, says Russia wanted to bring depression to Ukraine ahead of the new year after a widespread attack. The mayor adds that 16 missiles were shot down and four people injured in the attack. Uh, Kiev, uh, thank you for for our partners who deliver to us anti-rocket systems and all all 16 rockets uh, which fly to direction in Kiev was uh, shut down, and uh, uh, some part of the rockets fall down and uh, destroyed uh, private buildings. Four people was in, uh, have injury. 
Right now, right now, 40% of uh, our citizens know electricity, but uh, our employees uh, uh, give the best in the next couple of hours to bring the electricity back. But we have still 20% uh, deficit of electricity because uh, we connected to whole system in Ukraine. The Russians want to bring depression, especially right now, Christmas time. New Year. The, the Russians want to bring us to, to black time, to uh, without uh, lighting, to without heating. Uh, they uh, have to bring the uh, depression mood to everyone. Instead, them Ukrainian people very angry, and they told better we stay without electricity and without heating, but we never give up. Meanwhile, Russian rockets cause windows to shatter at a psychiatric hospital. No patients or staff were harmed, but for Dr. Nelia Kearns, the attack was traumatic. She lost her home to an airstrike last February. She carries mental and physical scars from the attack in the early days of the war. Thursday's bombardment was fierce, even by the standards of this conflict, that has seen Russian forces pummel Ukrainian cities. Around 150 personnel and 468 patients were in the hospital at the time and remained indoors. Now let's look at Belarus, who, are, who have summoned Ukraine's ambassador after its defense minister said its air defenses had downed a Ukrainian S-300 missile in a field yesterday morning. During one of Russia's largest missile attacks against the Ukrainian country since the start of the war, now, the military comm commissar of the Brest region played the incident down in a video message posted on social media by the state-run news media, saying that local residents had absolutely nothing to worry about. He compared the incident to one in November when an S-300 believed to have strayed after being fired by Ukrainian air defenses landed in NATO member Poland, and initial fears of an escalation in the war were rapidly diffused. Now, Russian President Vladimir Putin presided over flag-raising ceremonies for newly built naval vessels, pledging to continue to support the strengthening of the Russian Navy. Putin, who oversaw the ceremonies via video link, says Russia will increase the numbers and variety of vessels available to its Navy. The newly commissioned vessels included the nuclear-powered submarines Emperor Alexander III and General Generalissimo Sovorov, along with two surface vessels. The newest nuclear missile carriers being built and produced there have no equal in the world in many specifications. New surface and underwater vessels have modern navigation, communication and sonar systems they have highly accurate weapons and robotic complexes. I emphasize that we will increase the pace and volume of construction of ships of various categories and equip them with the most modern types of weapons. We will conduct operational and combat training of sailors, taking into account the experience gained, including during the special military operation. In a word, to do everything to ensure Russia's security and protect our national interests in the world's oceans. Now let's talk to Dr. David Stontrum, Chair of Strategy and Policy Department Professor of Russian Studies, the Naval War College, joining us from Rhode Island in the USA. You're welcome to the program this morning. Good to be here. What can you tell us about this latest show of force, if we can call it that, by the Russian President Vladimir Putin concerning his naval strength? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily make that much of it. Um, the Russian Navy builds ships continuously. Um, what's interesting is that the Russian Navy generally is building ships pretty slowly. Uh, the speed of production is not high, so it's producing new vessels, and in this case, a new submarine. Um, but it takes time to do that. 
Uh, and so it's not strange that this has come online. There's nothing specific about this point in time. Ships this big take years to complete. And so it just happens that this submarine is complete at this particular time, and it's just a coincidence that it's ready in the middle of this big war. Now, Ukraine says that Russia's, Russia has carried out range of 120 missile strikes across the country. What do you think of this biggest aerial assault since it started the war in February? Again, like with the commissioning of the new submarine, I don't think this last particular event is especially significant. Um, what's been clear for the last several months is that Russia has been engaging in a systematic campaign of aerial bombardment of Ukraine, of using cruise missile and drone strikes to try to demoralize the Ukrainian population by striking um, power plants, by striking uh, some military facilities, but also a lot of facilities that are simply intended for civilian use. And one of the things that I think is worth repeating is that deliberately inflicting suffering on civilians in order to make civilians suffer is a war crime. Um, that is illegal by the laws of war and against international law. But the Russian government's been engaging in that systematically for the last several months. And the latest strikes are really nothing new. Well, that to be true, doctor, that he wants to demoralize and depress the Ukrainian people to the end that uh, they will be fed up with the war. If their will has not been broken so far, what makes him think that their will will be broken and what could possibly come off it? Is he thinking that maybe the Ukrainian people will rise against their own government? Uh, I think your question is a really good one. It's not clear at all what the logic is behind this. Um, one of the things that's been true historically is that when civilian populations are attacked, they don't get more sympathetic to the attacker. They rally around their own government. That was true in World War II of the British when they were bombed by the Germans. It was true of the Germans when they were bombed by the British and the Americans. Um, there was no move towards resentment of one's own government. The resentment is directed at the people who are bombing you. Um, and so this hasn't worked in the past to increase Ukrainian population's desire to end the war. Uh, if anything, it seems to have solidified their support for Zelensky. Uh, one of the things that's very clear about opinion polling of the Ukrainian population is that they are overwhelmingly in favor of continuing the war towards victory. Um, while theoretically in the future there might be some weakening of that sentiment, at the moment at least, it seems as though the Ukrainian population is overwhelmingly in favor of continuing to fight. Um, and when the Russian government continually engages in the deliberate targeting of civilian populations to leave them without power and heat in the middle of a winter, um, it, it's hard to see how that Ukrainian attitude is going to change. That will not make them any more inclined to see the Russian government as a, a viable negotiating partner. Speaking of viable negotiations, uh, the Russian president was said to have said he was open to talks uh, concerning uh, the war. Do you think it was just postulation as far as for the cameras or is serious about uh, about considering ending this war? So speaking only personally, because again, I've never met Vladimir Putin, but but judging by what I've seen, um, I don't take this last um, offer of negotiations especially seriously. Um, the military theorist Karl von Clausewitz remarked 200 years ago that aggressors are always peace-loving, and that aggressors always want to get what they want without a fight. Um, and so Vladimir Putin would be delighted to have Ukraine agree to give him what he wants, um, which is these four provinces, in addition to Crimea, uh, that he has declared annexed to the Russian government. Um, so of course, uh, he would be happy to end the war on those terms. It's not clear at all that Ukraine wants to end the war on those terms, um, that there's any pressure on Ukraine to do that. Um, what's interesting about this is that when Vladimir Putin talks about ending the war on his terms, it includes territory he doesn't possess. There are big chunks of territory that he claims to be part of Russia, territory that he's bombing repeatedly, um, that he does not control. And so in, uh, ending the war on his terms would mean Ukraine actually handing over territory that Russia does not today occupy. So again, it's hard to see this as a serious effort to end the war. Uh, I'm not convinced that Vladimir Putin um, has much in the way of, of concessions to offer to try to bring Ukraine to the negotiating table. Um, now, certainly, 
Putin and the Russian government have downgraded their aims from the very beginning of the war. At the beginning of the war, they wanted to change the Ukrainian government, and that's no longer on the table. Now Putin is talking about something much more limited in terms of territorial gains. Um, but again, it, it's simply not clear that he means this in any way seriously, other than he would like to get what he wants uh, without fighting anymore to get it. Is there any truth to this historical uh, ties of Ukraine to Russia, where the people of Ukraine really want to be a part of Russia, but certain elements in Ukraine don't want them to? So there's a. it is certainly historically true that there are deep, connections between Ukraine and Russia. Um, in the distant past, a um, thousand years ago, Kiev and Rus, the, a, a, a sort of a loose empire based around Kiev, included both Ukraine and much of what is Western contemporary Russia. Um, but that was, of course, headquartered in Kiev. Um, there were have been a, approximately 200, the, 200 years before the present, um, Ukraine has been ruled from Russia. But Ukraine has also been an independent state. It has also been part of uh, a Polish-Lithuanian state. And so to say, to pick particular moments in the past and say, because at this particular moment in the past, Ukraine was governed from Moscow, Ukraine should be governed from Moscow right now, makes no sense. That, simple, that logic simply doesn't follow. The other thing to note is that the Ukrainians have been fighting really hard not to be ruled from Moscow. Um, the evidence of the last year has shown that the Ukrainian public is willing to fight and fight quite vigorously to not be run for Moscow. And I, so I think that's pretty clear evidence uh, that the Ukrainian people do not particularly desire to be reunited with Russia. This isn't simply some cabal at the top that's fooling them. Uh, one of the things that we have seen repeatedly throughout this war um, is really some very emotional footage, um, especially from the beginning of the war, of grandmothers in Ukraine in perfect Russian telling Russian soldiers to go home, that they're not wanted. Um, so no, I don't think there's any basis for Vladimir Putin's idea that Ukraine deserves to be and wants to be part of a new Russian empire. Thank you for that insight, Doctor. You are the Chair of Strategy and Policy Departments of Russian Studies, the Naval War College. Um, from, your, from, your, from your expertise, what do you think, as far as strategy is concerned, that Putin is thinking to employ to tactically possibly win the war, or do you think he's given up as far as that is concerned? Do you think he wants to really crush the, Russia, the Ukrainian people militarily and get those territories, Again, and do you think that's what he wants to do? So stressing that I'm speaking only in a personal and not an official capacity, right. um, the strategy, such as it is, is hoping that with the passage of time, Ukraine will run out of resources. And that resource, those resources can be popular will, it can be um, soldiers who can fight, it could be support from Europe and the West and the United States. Um, I said, essentially, I think Vladimir Putin is playing a waiting game. It's clear that he did not think through what he was doing. He got himself into a war that turned out to be far more difficult than he had anticipated. And I think now he sees himself without any path to retreat gracefully. Um, he could admit defeat. Uh, he could admit that his uh, war has been a disaster for the people of Ukraine and for the people of Russia and for himself, um, and that it's been a fiasco. But he's not in a position to do that. He's not willing to do that. And so he's hoping that rather than admit defeat, he can keep fighting. And if he waits long enough, he will be able to outlast the commitment of either the Ukrainian people or of the West to support Ukraine. Um, but that's a long game that means an awful lot of human suffering. It means more Ukrainian lives and more Russian lives lost in the hopes of salvaging some satisfactory settlement from, from his point of view. What do you, are you pleased or do you think that the mediation between the countries concerned uh, that surround uh, Europe and America, that they, they've done enough to, to mediate between Russia and Ukraine? So mediation is never bad, but it requires that there be some degree of common ground between the two sides that they can agree on, that both sides would say, I I'm not going to get all that I want, but I accept this intermediate settlement. So mediation means finding some middle ground. And right now, it's not clear to me that that middle ground exists. It's not clear to me that um, there is a solution that both Ukraine and Russia today would find acceptable. 
Uh, Zelensky says, and opinion polling seems to support this, that the Ukrainian people agree they will keep fighting until they get all of Ukraine back. They want their territory back that Russia has seized starting in 2014. Uh, and the Russian government, for the moment at least, says that's not acceptable, that it wants not just to keep Crimea, it wants to keep Crimea and these additional four provinces that Russia has illegally annexed. Um, and so without that middle ground, mediation can only do very little. Uh, it requires both sides to see some common ground. And the point of a war is you couldn't find common ground, and so you're fighting about it. Uh, and so I don't see at the moment a, a short-term end to the fighting simply because of mediation. There just is no meeting of the two sides on what they find is an acceptable solution. Vladimir Putin attacked Ukraine and has killed uh, thousands of Ukrainians. They're not, not particularly interested in stopping a fight right now, at least by all evidence that we can see. How helpful do you think it was? Well, we know how helpful it was for Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky to uh, appear before the U.S. Senate and to be, uh, to be accorded the welcome by Joe Biden. But what do you think it did from the Russian side? Do you think it was provocative? Do you think it was helpful? So provocative, I think, would be the wrong word, in a sense, because the war was provoked by Vladimir Putin. He's the one that decided to start the war. Um, he was the one who invaded Ukrainian territory. And so it would be a little strange for the man to, who invaded Ukraine and started the war to say he was been provoked um, by the country that he's attacked seeking help. Um, was it helpful? I think it was very helpful to uh, Vladimir Zelensky in that it demonstrated to his audience at home um, that he has the support of international partners. That has been true in, in a very concrete sense of money and, and weapons. Um, I think it was helpful to him in terms of the American public. Um, there are elements of both parties, um, a, a small number of people on the far left of America's Democratic Party and a somewhat larger number on the far right of America's Republican Party that have been opposed to aid to Ukraine. But it's all been in a very abstract sense. Um, they're opposed to it for kind of very general or in some cases fictitious reasons. Um, so when Zelensky appears before Congress uh, and makes his case, I think it gets much harder um, for opponents of Ukrainian aid in the United States to make their case. So I think it was enormously helpful to Zelensky's case in solidifying American backing. Um, and, and again, helpful to him at home. It was certainly not helpful to Vladimir Putin, um, not at all. Uh, but again, this is a, a war that Vladimir Putin got himself into, uh, and I think has found it far more difficult than he anticipated. And this is just one more example of how um, his war effort has gone badly wrong. And we hope that that war ends sooner than later. Thank you so much, Dr. David Stonentrim, Chair, Strategy and Policy Department, Professor of Russian Studies, the Naval War College. Thank you for coming on the program this morning. It's been my pleasure. After the break, the ruble hits an eight-month low against the dollar as oil prices fall. Please stay with us. Welcome back to our coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. To the financial aspect of this war now, Russia's currency has hit an eight-month low yesterday, adding to sharp declines in December as global oil prices fell and Western sanctions targeted Russia's energy sector. The ruble hovered below 72 to the dollar, down 18% from the start of the month, its weakest level since late April. After almost halving in value in the first weeks of the war, the ruble has helped has held up rather remarkably well for most of the year, trading within a narrow range. It has been helped by measures from Russia's central bank, which more than doubled interest rates at the start of the war, introduced capital controls, and forced exporters to convert 80% of their earnings into rubles, artificially creating demand for the currency. He later rolled back some of those policies as the exchange rate stabilized. Now, with the price of oil, Russia's biggest export down by about a third from its June peak, and an EU embargo on seaborne oil plus Western price cap mechanisms now in place, Russia's oil export revenues are likely to fall. 
This means there will be less foreign currency to prop up the ruble. The International Energy Agency says this month that Russian oil export revenues fell by $700 million in November because of falling oil prices. And joining us is Channel Television's Ini John Mekwa. Hi, um, Lumide. <laughs> Sorry. It's good to see you. <laughs> yeah, good to see you too. Right. So now, Kazakhstan oil pipeline operator sent a request to its Russian counterpart to send Kazakh crude via the pipeline to Germany next year. But before we go to that question, let's begin with the ruble mm. and its, uh, its decline. Yes. Is, it, is this something that will last or you see them rebounding? Well, um, we've been talking about the ruble since the beginning of the year, but uh, even though it declined yesterday, even till date, it's still the best performing in the world, the best performing currency. And that's because it's had a lot of punches, you know, from the sanctions following the war. But we still see it doing well. Uh, we, we've, we've seen a lot of uh, strategies by the Russian government to help boost the ruble. So now we know that there are some uh, India, China, and some of those friendly, Russia-friendly countries that trade in the ruble. Then we did talk about it sometimes, some months ago, how... Uh, the, when it was a tax paying period, the companies that are still operating in Russia, they pay their taxes in ruble. So that means they get, um, uh, uh, maybe their parent companies will send in dollar and they'll have to buy ruble. And you know, once you place a demand on anything, including the ruble, then of course the value goes up. So it goes up, the value goes up and, and uh, the ruble, that's why, that's why the ruble is still doing so well. So this is a decline, we understand, but I mean, when you look at the bigger picture for the year, especially as the year comes to an end, the ruble is still the best performing in the world uh, as of today, and most likely it will recover. Because, I mean, you, you, you talked about the issue of the oil revenue to Russia, but we still know that Russia is still selling and still even creating or um, winning more market share for oil. And in spite of that price cap, they are still making between 10 and 15 billion dollars every month from oil sales. They do have other commodities because Russia seems to have before now prepared itself and developed a lot of its natural resources. So you see a lot of demand on the ruble. You see uh, uh, Russia also being very strategic in, in uh, and that's why they will say if you want to buy our oil, you have to open uh, the uh, accounts with their banks and all of that and deal in ruble. So all of that adds more value to the ruble and that's why it seems like this decline will not last for long. In May, uh, most likely recover in a very short time. They certainly, well, for those who want the war to end, uh, if the money fails, then it'll affect the war negatively for Russia. Yeah, but well, you so, sorry, the thing is, if, if it fails for Russia, it also affects other countries. So if Russia is not sending in its oil, if Russia, for instance, stops selling oil at all, then we would see a shortage in supply and a hike in price. That's kind of good for a country like Nigeria if we can boost our production. Mm. But it also, uh, if they were to stop selling, they have fertilizer, they have yeah. the grains, they have uh, the uh, metals. If they were to stop all of that, then the world is going to be, even as we speak, they still have gas that is being bought by some European countries and all of that. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if um, while we try to stop Russia from earning any money, then it also stops the world from commodities, from metals, from gas and energy and all of that. So it becomes everybody's problem and it just goes a long way to show us that the world is connected you know, and exactly. one, Global one country's village, exactly uh, one country's problem is, is is another's problem. Just have to figure our way around it. <laughs> to the Kazakhstan dimension now, you can yeah. talk about the oil pipeline operator sending yeah. a request to its Russian counterpart. Yes, yeah, so you know that uh, uh, European countries are trying to win themselves off Russian fossil fuels and uh, they Correct. have days and, and all of that. It's funny because it's, it seems like Russia is, I don't know, getting friendly. Because some days ago we did see that they agreed there's a pipeline that has been put up, that has been shut down since May, you know, to transfer gas and oil and all of that. They have agreed to turn it back on and supply oil to Europe. Now, this Kazakhstan, uh, Europe is trying to get oil from Kazakhstan, and there's a pipeline, draws bar. It goes, it starts from Russia, goes through Ukraine, Belarus, 
Poland and, and other countries before it gets to Europe. So now Russia is saying they may agree that Kazakhstan can actually send its own oil. You know, Kazakhstan also has its own oil. Yeah. They can actually sell their oil to Europe and allow it to go through this pipeline, which is going through unfriendly uh, um, uh, countries because we know that Belarus and Russia are not friendly countries when it comes to Europe. So it would be very generous and gracious of them to allow that uh, Kazakhstan can actually send the oil to Europe through this pipeline that goes through their countries. And Russia says they're considering giving a, a nod to that. In the midst of this entire affair, now we know that Russian people, the tourists, are flocking to Turkey to celebrate the New Year season. Yeah, well, uh, we, 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 Turkey has been a middleman in so many ways, the grain deals, the talks, and, and, and all of that. So it seems they're actually gaining now if Russians, and a, a lot of those other countries, Poland and all of that, they had closed their, not really closed their borders, but they became stricter in giving visa to Russians, you know, to come into their country, because a lot of Russians just wanted to leave the country, maybe go for holiday. This one is talking about the holiday season, the New Year season, and all of that. So it's now Turkey that is open for them. And so far we hear that 28% of ticket sales are from Russians who want to come and spend the holiday, the New Year holiday in Turkey. That's a boost for Turkey because they've also not been having it easy. Their inflation has been really high. Their currency has been depreciating. And uh, uh, they've also had the weather issue disturb their production and all that. So this might be, you know, one good window for them is, is, is the number point. a significant number the tourists that are flocking to turkey is yeah, yeah, yeah. A very yeah significant it's, number? It's, it is significant for them to have 28 percent alone you know from russia to turkey because you do have other people who will also go to turkey mm -hmm. but if you have 28 percent so far because it's not the end of it yet you know going to turkey for tourism that's good uh, you talk about the hospitality you talk about uh, the delicacy you know even the small businesses around expected you know, to, to benefit from this. So it should, it's a good one for Turkey. And uh, I was uh, hoping that there's no, I mean, so far anyway, we haven't heard of any secondary sanctions coming from the west of the Turkey because Turkey has been in the middle of this for, for such a long time. And all oh, this yes, seems yes, to be indeed. getting away from me. Thank you so much, Eni, for your contribution to the program this Thank morning. you. Thank you for having me. Now, explosions rattled villages and cities across Ukraine on Thursday in what the government has described as one of Russia's largest missile barrages since the war began. Russian territories have been saving one of the most massive missile attacks since the beginning of the full-scale invasion for the last day of the year, according to Ukraine's defense ministry in a statement on Twitter. And they also add, quote, they dream that Ukrainians will celebrate the new year in darkness and the cold, but they cannot defeat the Ukrainian people. British Defense Secretary Ben Wallace has assured the Ukrainian government that the UK will allocate 2.3 billion pounds in aid to Ukraine in 2023, adding that some of it will be non-military and humanitarian support. Wallace made the statement after Russia had fired scores of missiles into Ukraine early on Thursday, targeting the capital Kiev and other cities including Lviv and Odessa in the west and south, in one of its largest aerial bombardments sending people running to shelters and knocking out power. Air raid sirens rang out across Ukraine and in Kiev sounded for five hours, one of the longest alarms of the war. Well, last year it was 2.3 billion, uh, and from financial year 2023, it'll be, we'll put in another 2.3 billion. That is, some of that is uh, non-military aid, some of that is you know, the likes of humanitarian support, such as generators. Some of that is uh, obviously military hardware. Some of it is training. We train 10,000, we trained uh, Ukrainians in the UK, and we'll train another 20,000 in the UK. And some of it is effectively backfilling British stocks. So stocks we've given away, we need to replace to make sure our armed forces are are up to date and on the forefront of being able to defend ourselves. So that's what makes up the 2.3 billion. We're committed to another 2.3 billion for 2023. Well, first of all, Britain is at the forefront of, of its efforts to help. We put in only recently thousands of anti-air missiles to help bring down these Iranian drones that Russia is now firing rather indiscriminately, both at critical national infrastructure and indeed civilian areas. Uh, and we'll continue to use our know-how, our training, 
and indeed any hardware support we can in 2023 to make sure that Ukraine can defend itself. When we return, restaurant turns into ice castle in Blizzard. Join us again. Welcome back to our special coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. And now joining us in the program this morning is Mr. Vince Oyekwelu, National Security Risk Strategist and former British police officer. You're welcome to the program, speaking to us via Zoom from Enugu Agidi in Anambra State. You're welcome. Thank you so much for that pronunciation. Thank you. It appears that, I hope it was correct. It appears that, um, yeah, oh, great. It appears that, Fuel has been added to the fire with the latest barrage of strikes by Russia into Kiev. What are your initial thoughts? Honestly, uh, you see, when you come to war strategy, you don't have to play into the enemy's hands. What is going on is overstatement. The statement of the U.S. government claiming that the winter season will reduce warfare, will stop strikes on key or on Ukraine wasn't the best of statement. I think that was an overstatement. And what Russians are trying to do with their new general strategy, he's trying to prove to Mr. Putin that you made it the best choice to make me the, the new general of the war, of the oppressions in Ukraine. What he's trying to do is to prove to the Americans that you cannot dictate this war. You cannot tell us when to strike or when not to strike because nobody detects for the Ukrainians when they strike uh, Russian territories and when they're done. So I think this was an overstatement made by the American government and the um, Russians are trying to prove them wrong that you don't dictate in this war, that they want to fight this war in their own comfort zone. In the long-term prosecution of the conflict, how uh, badly do you think this affects the Ukrainian uh, effort? Hugely, hugely. Uh, yesterday, uh, the Ukrainian government is talking about the effect on their ecosystem of all this munition is going to have on their soil texture, on future agricultural products, on children's lives, on the new children that we born, on mat 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 maternal death. So the effect of all these attacks now coming into the heart of Kiev, coming to the heart of Odessa, coming to the heart of Lviv, these are almost the most southern part, the furthest region between Russia and Ukraine. It shows the capacity. Do not forget that the war that you've been seeing, that the military warfare that's being used or deployed are still the minimum and the semi-military warfare. Most of them have not deployed, uh, deployed the average warfare. Example, the missile launching the range of missiles used. There are missiles that can be deployed from Russia that can even hit Poland. And don't forget that Ukraine is between Russia and Poland. So Russia has the capacity to hit as far as Poland. So that means Russia can even hit any part of Ukraine, but they have not deployed that. Now, the idea of the Ukrainians getting the petrol, petrol missiles from the U.S., wonderful. But the cost of using the petrol missiles to fight uh, the, the Iranian uh, UAVs, the cost is too high. The cost of one petrol missile is huge. And then the EC of training. It would take Ukrainians about four months or six months to master the use of the petrol missile. So that's not going to be used in the, in, the, in, the, in the near future. Don't forget what happened in Belarus. We are... The Russian government is accusing Ukrainians for firing surface to air missiles into their territory. This is examples of poor training. Because to use most of those surface to air missiles, you need proper four month training. And each one is manned about 90 personnel to use just one battery of surface to air missiles. So Americans should have started this training, this deployment of these missiles 
the patriotic missiles, the patriotic missiles on time. To give the Ukrainian soldiers enough time for them to be trained. Don't forget, there's the statistics that Russians have lost about 100,000 soldiers killed and many of them injured. What it means that the Ukrainians have probably lost more than 100,000 both killed and injured. So the bottom line is the oppressions are going on, and this is the middle of the winter. If you have lived in the northern side of Europe or in, sorry, in the eastern side of Europe, you will not stay in any of those countries without having a heater. It's suicidal. People are dying. People are suffering. It's suicidal. You raise an interesting point in your response where you mentioned uh, the use of restraint on the part of Russia. We know that they have the military power, they are a world power to obliterate Ukraine if it comes to that, but that's not their point. They want to annex Ukraine, they want to make Ukraine theirs. How do you think um, Russia is going to continue to prosecute this war? Do you think a ground offensive is, is, is possible again, given the um, number of casualties, some of which uh, has been speculated to be in the hundreds of thousands? Or they'll just continue to wage the war from a distance? Strategically speaking, strategically speaking, Russia has the capacity to still use ground forces to enter into Ukraine from different points of contact, right from the, from, the, from the east, right from the north, because they, they share common borders. They share the whole part of Lushank region, the whole part of Donetsk region are all connected to, the, to, to Ukraine. So there are so many entry points. Secondly, let's not forget what started this war. It's not, let's, let's talk uh, being fair because lives are being lost. What started this conflict? It's not about the sheer desire of President Putin and Russia to annex Ukraine. No. What started this war was the attempt by NATO to set up missile batteries facing Russia, even so close that you can hit Moscow from that part of Ukraine, where this missile batteries are supposed to be installed. Don't forget what happened in 1960 during the War of the Peace, when Russia, when Russians set up missile batteries in Cuba that we are facing the United States of America, and the USA told Cuba, you have to dismantle these missiles facing our country, or we are going to war against you, Cuba. And those missile batteries we are dismantled. So NATO has no right to install missile batteries facing Moscow that could hit Moscow. And the superpower, the superpower, Russia said, this is wrong. It's outside the agreement arrangement that we have. Nobody should set such missile batteries facing our country or else allow us to be a member of NATO. Russia applied to be a member of NATO. NATO rejected for reasons best known to NATO. So let's be balanced. That Russians, we are responding to a military uh, installation of missile batteries that we are facing Moscow, which no smart country. Ghana cannot set up missile batteries that, that will face Nigeria, that can hit Abuja, and we keep quiet. Nigeria, we say there is no need. That is a sign of aggression. So based on your own question, the truth of the matter is the war is going ongoing. Lives are being lost. Negotiations need to be made because Russia is still selling their gas even to European countries. European countries are still buying their gases directly from Russia or indirectly from India and China and other countries that Russia is supplying directly. There is no need for Nord Stream 1 to be shut down and Nord Stream 2 to be shut down because the Americans, as much as I respect them, shouldn't be uh, so envious that somebody's natural resources in oil and gas that Russians are selling and making a killing, making heavy money. I don't know the, the balance where you can convince me that it's cheaper to send gas through ships all the way from the USA to Europe. I am an European. And it concerns me that this war of Russia and Ukraine is affecting European economy, whereas it's not affecting the USA economy. Mm. The, U the Europeans should come down and have a discussion 
to stop this war so that Ukraine will be fed and Russia will be fed. In conclusion, that's another, that's another very good point. That's another very good point. But let me stop you there. Uh, and uh, uh, just a quick footnote from you. Do you think that Ukrainians, NATO proposed NATO membership, part of which you mentioned is a setting up of, uh, of weapons close to the border, really will constitute a threat to Russian sovereignty down the road? Do you think Ukraine could ever want to even attack Russia or cause Russia any kind of harm? Even if they were NATO members, even if that it's those weapons were there. Okay. Okay. We'll leave it there then. We'll leave it there then. Okay. Thank you, you so much for your. You thank you so much. Yes, I I understand you totally. I really appreciate. We really appreciate your your thoughts on the matter, uh, Mr. Vince Onyekwelu, National Security Risk Strategist and former British police officer. Thank you for coming on our program this morning. Now. We'll turn our attention to uh, the sports elements of, of, this, uh, of this conflict, where there are Ukrainians who are uh, sports gurus and champions around the world. Take, for instance, in boxing, where former world heavyweight and cruiserweight champion Evander Holyfield believes Ukraine's Alexander Yusik has the advantage in the upcoming fight against Tyson Fury, the unification of the heavyweight championships in 2023. Now, Holyfield feels that Yusek's speed can work to his advantage, just like he did in his heyday against bigger fighters. At Yusek, Holyfield was first a cruiserweight champion and then made the jump to the top flight, where he beat storied fighters such as George Foreman and Mike Tyson. Shakhtar Donia CEO Serhii Palkin insists that talks remain ongoing with Arsenal over the potential transfer of Mihalo Mudrik. Arsenal's initial offer was turned down last week, with each communication insisting that talks were to continue. The Gunners have been strongly linked with the forward signature since the summer, where they were believed to have made the initial contact over a potential deal. Mudrik's stock has risen somewhat since the initial contact, with his impressive goals in the Champions League. Finally, the Christmas blizzard, which has been ravaging parts of the U.S. and Canada, turned hoax restaurant and bar into Hamburg, Newcastle, rather, that is in Hamburg, Newcastle, into an ice castle. Hoax has been a family business since 1949, when Hoax Lodge's grandparents and great uncle bought the building that earlier had served as an ice cream parlor, and before that, as a bait and tackle shop. Now in its low season, it employs 89 people. In the summer, the payroll is closer to 140. Oak Lounge says last weekend, ice made a shell around the old building erected in the early 1900s, and it protected it from any objects that, like Erie, that could have tossed at it during the storm. But it's hard to estimate the damage just yet. For that, she'll have to wait until the ice melts. But for now, all she knows is that Hoke's new parking lot needs to be rebuilt because it was completely destroyed in the blizzard. And you remember that the harsh winter in Ukraine is said to be uh, a talking point concerning the efforts uh, around the war. And that's where we leave it on our special coverage today of Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Olumide Makoli. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great weekend.